Good morning, Pastor John Davis, Amityville Community Church. Let's open our time with a word of prayer. Father God, do want to thank you for this day. Thank you for what this day represents in your in the religious calendar, the fact that we celebrate the celebrate may be an awkward word, Lord God, but we, we do appreciate that your son Jesus Christ died for us to redeem us from all sin and iniquity. So we ask now that you would bless this time in your word uh, for your glory and our much needed good in Jesus' name, amen. Before getting into the message proper, I would like to state that we realize, hopefully, that Good Friday is more of a traditional holiday. Jesus Christ was crucified, but Scripture does not uh, recount any Friday as a particular day of his crucifixion. I would submit to you, uh, you look at Exodus chapter 12 of the Passover lamb and the key times of when the lamb, uh, the dates of the lamb being brought into the city and when the lamb was offered for the Passover, those dates would 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 almost seem to coincide better with Jesus being crucified on a Thursday as opposed to a Friday. Uh, you could look at Exodus chapter 12, and also, if he's crucified on a Thursday, it then it then brings to uh, a, a perfect harmony that the Son of Man will be in the the earth, just as Jonah was in the fish three days and three nights. If he was crucified on a Thursday, he would have been in the ground Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, and then uh, Friday morning, Saturday morning, and part of Sunday morning, realizing he rose on the first day of the week. So I, I submit that to you because I know there are some who question the Good Friday, and I would be one to tell you that it is not a specific uh, biblical date that is offered by Scripture. We celebrate the crucifixion of Jesus on this day for various reasons why, as you notice, even Easter itself is moved around. We'll not go into that now, but uh, just something to kind of, for information's sake, for those who may have questioned that. But I would like to bring your attention to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, verses 38 through 44. And I, and I would like to uh, let you know that we call this Good Friday um, because what, when Jesus died on the cross, the celebration of that was a good thing for sinners. And before going any further, I'd like to go on with the passage. We'll read Luke chapter 23, verses 38 to 44, because what I believe we're going to see is there are some valuable encouraging, hopeful, inspiring, just soul galvanizing truths that are in this passage. Luke chapter 23 verses 38 to 44. And it says, and an inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Verse 44, Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. May the Lord bless the word. The word is already blessed, but bless it to our hearts. I'd like to start with verse 44 as sort of a preface of why we need this this message of Good Friday, of good hope. Now, it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. As I give this Good Friday message, we realize that this is a unique time in, in our history right here on planet earth. We are experiencing somewhat of a pandemic. I do want to remind us, however, that this pandemic of the COVID-19 or coronavirus, I will not dwell on this long. Again, we remind ourselves that places like Vietnam, Cambodia, Syria, Sudan, they go through situations that are much more tragic, much more 
catastrophic, much more devastating in nature on a daily basis. There are children in these lands that literally drink from pools of water where elephants drop their dung. So what we're facing, it, it, it's, it's just... I, I, I want to say this with great reverence and respect, but in light of other cultures, in light of other societies, in light of other civilizations and countries, what we're facing is somewhat light. There is the, the, the war, the terrorism, the persecution of Christians, and yet this verse 44 is so appropriate because as I say those things, we realize there is darkness that exists on planet earth. There's a darkness that exists in our land in totality. When this virus is removed, there still will be a darkness. The darkness of, of sin, the darkness of wickedness, the darkness of hate, of murder, of violence. So there's a darkness that, that will not simply vanish when this passes. I fear that sometimes even the church has bought into the fact when this is over, things will be better. Things may be better in the earthly sense, but there's a spiritual darkness that will always pervade planet Earth. We read in 1 John chapter 5, uh, I want to say probably around verse 18 to 20, I believe it's 19, but a phrase, the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. The whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So this lets us know that, that this earth will always be under a sense of darkness. So now what I want to give you is a message of light on this Good Friday, a message of hope on this Good Friday. So I want you to follow the passage closely. So I want to to, to start off and backdrop because as we see this darkness, we're going to realize that the answer for darkness is Jesus. Jesus is the light of the world. So I want to want to first bring us to this place now. Now I want to want to show you, I want to give you a backdrop. You want to notice in the passage, Jesus does not evangelize either criminal. He doesn't say anything to either, either criminal. Why do I bring that up? Sometimes we as believers, we need to ask God for wisdom when to speak and when not to speak. If Jesus, the son of the living God, please notice this. If Jesus, the son of the living God is on a cross between two criminals and he does not say a word, we need to be careful of always speaking. Some of us, no matter where we go, we start to evangelize when maybe we need to pray pray for God to show us if it is the appropriate time and what words to say. So I bring that up because notice many of us, sometimes we may be pushed into the sense, oh, we, and this, and remember they're on the cross. So this would be in essence, what we call in our contemporary culture, uh, a deathbed conversion almost to say. And so when people, we almost rush in, but you know, sometimes we need to step back and let God do his work. I want to remind some of us that God really does not need us. While he commands us to make disciples, he does not need us because you got some wise men. Amen? You know the Christmas story? Some wise men see a star and they say, let's go find a savior. We, we, we have a Paul on the road to Damascus. He gets a a first-hand taste of the master evangelist himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me set that kind of backdrop to start with, that we see that Jesus here, that, that Jesus has not really delved into just, oh, they're on the course, I got to quickly give a message to, to, to let them know the gospel. No, Jesus has confidence in who? I'm going to use what the old saints, the, the, the Bible, if you read a newer version, says Holy Spirit. But for the sake of today, I, I, I'm, I'm compelled to use the term the Holy Ghost. Yes, I'm compelled to use the term the Holy Ghost. So I want you to, to look at this and, 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 and consider this, this message here right now. So Jesus, while on the cross between the, the, two, the two criminals, he, he is not compelled to start speaking, and he's the master evangelist. Maybe we need to take a note. Some of us, no matter where we go, we're evangelizing, and, and that may be a noble sentiment, but we need to pray and say, Lord, is this a person? And, and how will they receive it? Am I even saying the right thing at the right time in the right manner? Am I using the right text? Just because I have a bottled version of the scripture, a bottled version of evangelism, does not mean that I need to give it to each person. But even saying that, so let's, let's start off with this. We've already started off, so to say. 
So we, we start here, we see that there's, it, it makes that comment about darkness on the, the face of the earth. But we have a scene with two criminals. Now, Jesus being crucified with these two criminals, he was numbered with the transgressors. That's a fulfillment of a prophecy in Isaiah chapter 53. He was numbered with the transgressors. Right now, our Savior is on a cross, and he's being treated as though he was a criminal. He's being treated as though he was a, a man of, of, of wicked and ill repute. So we understand that this is already a unique situation. But I want to, want to see if we could see how certain things happen here. First of all, let's, let's notice, and, and this is so important, please note this. We're going to start with the first one. But the, then one of the criminals, verse 39, then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. Now, we need to recognize that this is a common, a common spiritual outlook for the wicked, for the pagan, for those who do not know Jesus personally. This is a common mental approach to God. If you are God, do this. If you are God, do that. If you are God, save my mother. If you, so, so we already start that God needs to prove himself. So that is such a perfect representation of the world. Yes, amen, the world. We have two criminals. One is going to represent the converted sinner, the one who's going to become a saint, but one represents the world. So the world has this idea that if God was a loving God, he would not, he would not allow this particular climate of, of illness. If he was a loving God. So, so, but notice how that attitude is defined as what? Blasphemy. Blasphemy. Now we need to understand that many of us don't like to say these terms. We don't like to speak these terms. But what we're going to see, glory to God, we're going to see something powerful here. We're going to see the other criminal as a bold witness. The other criminal is a is, is going to speak with authority. And, 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 and he speaks with authority. And the other man, there's no record of the other man turning. But sometimes we don't speak with authority. We're almost apologizing for God. We're almost trying to defend why God does something. And notice how the man responds. I want to just delve. Do you not even fear God? See, he doesn't start trying to justify what God does. One of the reasons why our witness may be weak, one of the reasons why our witness may be weak is because we seek to justify God. Instead of pointing out, you need to just fear God. We need to speak with the, some authority that God is on the throne and he needs to be feared. This, this man on the cross, this second criminal on the cross, I say second because he's the second one to speak. This second one in, in many ways has a bolder witness, a bolder authority. A, a greater certainty than some of us. Some of us, we get in the in the presence of, of our pagan friends and we're scared. Oh, well, if God was a loving God, why does he allow? And as opposed to saying God is God, he can do what he likes, we start trying to give these, these academic answers, which we're really not capable of giving with any real certainty anyway. Sometimes we need to let just God handle his business. So it goes on, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. So we have here, if you are. So already this man has set a dynamic in motion that not only does he not believe him, but it's almost as Jesus has to prove himself. Now understand, I want to clarify this. This is a critical point. Jesus will prove himself to his people. Consider Thomas. Consider Thomas. There's a way that Jesus proves himself to his people when we are like little children who have doubt. So he proves himself. Remember the, the man whose son was ill? Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. So as a father, as a savior, Jesus will prove himself over and over again to his people because he knows that our asking for proof is in reverence, is, is, is in reverence, is in, in awe of his majesty, and we just are struggling a little bit. This is not the arrogance of, if you are God, you will do such and such. If you're so loving, you will do such and such. That's arrogance. Ours is the sense of desperate need, 
acknowledging that only God can help our unbelief, that God, we need a sign because we're floundering. We know you're good. We know you're on the throne. We just need a little boost in our faith. Amen. So that, that first thief is, is a, and notice the word blasphemy. Many times we're so busy trying to give these apologetic and academic truth. It's just blasphemy. We need to cut to the heart of the matter. Not saying that there is not a valuable place for apologetics. There is a valuable place for scholarly and academic approach to this, but we want to make sure that we identify when someone is just in a blasphemous state of mind. They're questioning God with arrogance, conceit, bordering on the, the idea, bordering on the, 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 the personality of a Lucifer himself. That's the pride. We, we see that in 1 Timothy 3, that the pride that caused Lucifer, the, called Lucifer to fall, it says, if somebody's going to be an elder, let him not be a novice, lest he be puffed up with pride and fall into the same condemnation of the devil. You can read that 1 Timothy chapter 3. So we have this one criminal, and I don't want to spend too much time on him because we're going to see what happens now. Now, I, wanna, I want you to notice this because this second thief, this second thief, what the second thief is not doing, or rather this, let me go back, what Jesus is not doing to the second thief, what Jesus is not doing to the second thief, he's not evangelizing him. Now, some want to speculate that, oh, he heard this teaching before, he heard this before. Well, even if he heard it before, at this point, there is no record of, record of Jesus speaking to this second thief on the cross. But you know who's speaking to him? the Holy Ghost. Oh yes, what we're going to see is how, remember we, we started off, the wise men, they saw a star and something moved them to go follow this star. We, we saw that, we saw uh, the, the apostle Paul firsthand from Jesus himself on the road to Damascus. The ascended Christ decided that he needed to evangelize Saul himself. So, but notice now, I, I bring that up because again, Jesus makes it clear in the gospel of John chapter 3, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. You'll notice here, there's no altar call. Many times we're asking people to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, but that's not a biblical reference. We want people to have a personal relationship with God. Let me always state this for the fact. Everyone has a personal relationship with God. It is either a relationship of an adversarial nature, of a negative nature, of an enemy uh, enmity nature, or it's a, a, a relationship of a father to son. Everybody has a relationship. One is either under wrath, under condemnation, or one is under justification and redemption. But God knows all of us in a certain manner. I don't want to delve into that, but I want to notice that this man is going to give us, and I, whenever I speak about the thief on the cross, I like to call it Bible 101. Bible 101, because first of all, notice what he does. He's witnessing to the second thief. Excuse me, the second thief is witnessing to the first thief. Jesus is doing no evangelism because the Holy Ghost has infused this second thief. So already he rebukes him. And what does he say to him? But the other answering rebuked him. See, many times we don't rebuke people. Many times we don't rebuke people. So what happens is we, 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 we're just kind of, so, but, but when speak, people speak against God, we got to know when to rebuke them. That's Holy Ghost power. But, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses for me. Amen. You shall be witnesses for me. Amen. So what, what that's letting us know, when the Holy Spirit comes, there's a power that comes in the witness. And apparently, this second thief has the Holy Spirit. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? Now, notice verse 41. Here's another. I don't want us to miss this statement. And notice what he says, And we indeed justly. And we indeed justly justly. Why this is so important is because what happens is many times we don't want to let people know they're under condemnation. Many times we don't let people know that they're under condemnation. We make people think that they're not too bad. Jesus is not a marriage therapist. Jesus is not a, a life coach. Jesus is not a personal mentor 
for our finances. What Jesus is, he's the savior, he's the redeemer. So we need to let people know they're under condemnation. Notice, oh yes, the man is using biblical language, condemnation. He's referring to guilt, wickedness, sinfulness, and transgression. So he says, do you not fear God? And notice what he says, seeing you are under the same condemnation. And then he says, and we indeed justly. Notice how he understands he's under condemnation too. Oh, come on now. Come on now. Because you're going to see Bible 101. So he points out that the other man is under condemnation. He points out that he is under condemnation. And now his, his revelation of truth to this, to this first thief is going to become even more great. Look at what he says. And we indeed justly, oh, amen. Now, come on with me. Follow what I'm about to tell you. There are many in the church, many in the church who don't believe they deserve a cross. Have mercy, Jesus. There are some who think we're not so bad. We're not so vulgar. We're not so obscene. We're not so profane. We haven't violated some really bad laws. We're basically good people. Let me tell you this. When we, when we think that way, we realize that we're drifting from God. Oh, yes, we're drifting from God. This man is about to die. He says we deserve what we're getting. We deserve this condemnation. We deserve this execution. We deserve this brutal punishment that is brought forth by the Roman Empire. We deserve it. And many times we want to start making people feel good about themselves. Jesus doesn't make him feel good about himself. Did you notice how the Savior did not intervene? The Savior did not say it's not that bad. See, the Savior didn't introduce paradise yet. Come on with me. The Savior did not introduce paradise yet. See, many times we're introducing heaven before people are even convicted that they need salvation. We need to remind them of their condemnation, of our condemnation, how righteous God is, that we deserve the cross. Jesus doesn't deserve the cross. We deserve death, hell, Hades destruction. We deserve it, but God in his mercy will save some, but God in his mercy will deliver some, but God in his grace will redeem some. But notice, and we indeed justly. So that's a key point. See, this is Bible 101. He points out what condemnation, and he points out righteous condemnation. What is, what is uh, Psalm 51? The, the, the King David says that you may be just when you speak and blameless when you judge. That Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. See, that God is righteous when he condemns. See, so we have a group. We have even in the church. We know the world, but even in the church, we, we don't really believe that we are despicable in the sight of God. Have mercy. But the more evil we think we are, the more grace there will be. Because God loves the humble. God loves a contrite spirit. God loves a broken and a contrite spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. You, you, could, you could look this up in Luke chapter 18, where the man was praying in this parable Jesus gave, and the man prayed in such a way, he couldn't even lift his eyes to heaven. Amen? He was so humbled, he couldn't lift his eyes to heaven. He bit his breath saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, have mercy on me a sinner. So what we have in here is Bible 101. Yes, he's rebuking the man. He's informing him that he's under condemnation, but he recognizes he's under the same condemnation. And notice what he says, and we indeed justly, for we receive, verse 41, and for we receive the due reward of our deeds. And then he says this, Bible 101 again, but this man has done nothing wrong. Do you know, we want to be careful. There are times we may question God in a reverent manner. God, why did this happen to me? But God has done nothing wrong. Jesus is without sin. Oh, yes, he is a sinless savior. Jesus has no sin in his heart, no sin, never thought, word, or deed, violated any one of God's commandments. He did the Father's will perfectly. Now, why that is so critical is because he recognizes the character of Jesus. 
He's done nothing wrong. Amen. Jesus is not just a teacher. Jesus is not just a prophet on the level of Confucius, Buddha, Muhammad. Jesus is the sinless son of God doing nothing wrong. Amen. Oh, come on now. Bible 101, he's done nothing wrong. So this sets him apart from every other prophet, every other religious leader. Now, again, we as believers are not always bold to say this, but I'm, I'm going to give you I'm going to give you some boldness here, hopefully, that you don't have to question what God is is saying in the word. And notice who this is. This is a man who apparently Jesus has not said anything to yet, according to Scripture. But clearly God is working in his heart. Amen. And when God gives someone revelation, they can't hold it back. All you have to do is look at our brother Peter. Jesus says to the disciples, who do you say that I am? And when Jesus asked that question, Matthew 16, who do you say that I am? Peter is the only one to reply. The, the disciples all had a word about what people were saying. But when it came time for their personal revelation, Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So we see here that, that in Peter, when God gives revelation, there's certainty, there's authority. So notice what it said, but this man has done nothing wrong. Now I'm going to tell you something now. I want to, I want to go back to verse 44. Now it was about the sixth hour and there was darkness over all the earth. When there's darkness, what are you going to do? When there's darkness, now I know this is a little bit out of order. There are some of you contextual people out there, but, but you're going to see where I'm going with this. Because there's a spiritual darkness over all the earth. The question is, who do you turn to? Amen? See, what this lets you know, whether there's darkness on the earth, come on, whether there is darkness on the earth, oh, I'm excited about this, whether there's darkness on the earth or whether a person is hanging on a cross, Jesus can give you hope. Amen? See, we have reduced Jesus to being some kind of financial aid for our home and our mortgage. I say this regularly because the airwaves are, 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 are predominated with this materialism. But we want to preach the Jesus that even if you're on the cross, there's hope for you. That even in the most dire situations, that the Lord Jesus can deliver you. The Lord Jesus can, can bring you out. The Lord Jesus has a, a future for you. Oh, glory to God. See, we don't need to set things right. And what's amazing about this is Jesus is on a cross. But let me tell you something in case you had forgotten. Jesus being on a cross is better than a king with thousands of armies. Jesus on a cross is better than a thousand billionaires around you. Jesus on a cross is better than 15 million doctors who went to John Hopkins and graduated summa cum laude. Amen. Magna cum laude, rather. Magna, summa second. Magna. Understand? Jesus on a cross. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Jesus on a cross to the world. Come on. To the world, Jesus looks impotent. He looks weak. It looks like things are out of control. Now notice, this man is on a cross. This lets you know that there's Holy Ghost knowledge in the man, because while the man is on a cross, notice he does not ask for deliverance from the cross. He does not ask to be alleviated of his personal situation in, in, the, in the earthly sense. He just says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. See, this man has a kingdom mind. Many of us, our prayer life is so overwhelmed with material matters, of earthly matters, and yes, I will say even of matters of health at this time, we forget there's a coming kingdom. There's a promise of future glory. There's a promise of heavenly blessing. There's a promise of eternal bliss, but we are so consumed with the here and now, we forget about, Lord, make me ready for your kingdom. And, 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 and I like the way he phrases it, but I, I want to get back to that fact that Jesus on a cross is more powerful than any man who's walking around in so-called freedom. Jesus on a cross cannot be thwarted. He cannot be stopped. His power is still magnificent because look at what Jesus on a cross says. Jesus on a cross says what people on the world can't say. Oh, you didn't see that. You didn't see that. Jesus on a cross says a word 
that people on the world in the world cannot really say. Verse 43, and Jesus said to him, assuredly, oh, I like that word. Uh, I, had to, I had to stop on that word, assuredly. Now, people are going to promise you things, but people can die, amen? People, people can have accidents. Circumstances can go awry. But when Jesus says assuredly, you could take that. That's as, as they like to say in the vernacular, that's money in the bank. See, because Jesus is omnipotent, he has all power. Because he's omniscient, he understands all circumstances, situations, all possibilities, all variables of events. He's um, um, omnipotent, he's omniscient, and he's omnipresent. He could, people can't tell you assuredly, because the car broke down, they couldn't make it. The train was late, they missed the vital appointment. The doctor got sick and he couldn't perform the operation. And this is just the, the minor uncontrolled circumstances. Come on now, we need to hear when we go to Jesus and he says assuredly, amen. So see, Jesus on a cross, I like to say that one more time, Jesus on a cross can promise you things that people on the world with every earthly resource cannot deliver. Glory to God, who you're going to for you? Who, who are you going to to remove the darkness? Who are you going to, to to bring some light into this dark world? Who are you going to to help you carry your own personal course? Because the Bible does tell us we need to pick up our course daily and follow him. And notice what the man, he says, so, so he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I want to be careful here, but I want to I at least make an illusion. You read the gospel of Luke. There's a prodigal son. When he understands his own personal wickedness, you with me? When he understands his own personal transgression, he says, I'm not even worthy. I'm not even worthy to go back as a son. I'm not even worthy. I'll go back and just let me be your servant. Notice how this man does not say, bring me into the kingdom. He just says, remember me. I believe he's speaking from a position of humility. He's not convinced he deserves the kingdom. Amen. I'm always curious how some people think they're so deserving of heaven. No. We, what, what does, what is it? See what, what this man is saying. He, he understands he deserves hell and death. If you could just remember me, remember that, that Syrophoenician woman who says even, even the dogs eat from the crumbs of the table. She's just, can I just get a crumb Lord? I don't even need a loaf of your bread. See that remember me lets me know that. And, and by the way, by the way, when Jesus remembers us, it's better than if we were adopted into a million earthly families. See, when Jesus remembers, that's oh, amen. So he just knows. And, and notice how he speaks now. You notice how the revelation. Because where is Jesus? D you, did you forget? Jesus is where? On the cross. But this man suddenly have mercy. Even at this point, the disciples are not convinced of Jesus' kingly authority because they have scattered. They're running. They have fled. Peter has denied him. Judas has betrayed him. But the other ten are hiding. They're away. They've gone. When you see the resurrection, when you read the account in the Gospel of John, they're hiding for fear of the Jews. They're not convinced. In the Gospel of Luke, there, there's a, a conversation on the road to Emmaus with some disciples, and they said, we thought he was the one. But this thief on the cross, have mercy, this is Holy Ghost knowledge. You can't teach this kind of certainty. When this thief is on the cross, he's hanging next to Jesus on the cross. He still is sure that Jesus has a kingdom. How many of us think somebody on death row is going to come into a kingdom? How many of us think that there's somebody locked up in jail that really is going to bring us into a kingdom? But this man has certainty that Jesus, even though on a cross, is still a king, has a heavenly kingdom, and has the authority to remember people in his kingdom. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So this man has futuristic knowledge, futuristic hope that the cross 
by no means has diminished, decreased, has no way restrained or constrained the power of the great Savior. Come on, do you see why the world needs this message? Right now we live in a society where every day people are watching the news. And like I tell you before, if you watch the news, they call it breaking news. You see it flash across the screen, screen breaking news. And you know what breaking news does? It breaks your heart. Breaking news breaks your heart. Amen? Breaking news breaks your heart. And so what happens with this breaking news that breaks your heart, you need some good news. You need some news to dispel the darkness that's over the face of the earth. You need some news to let you know there is not just light at the end of the tunnel. There's glory. There's hope. There's the Lamb of God and God the Father and the blessed angels at the end of this tunnel. So he says, Lord, remember me. When you come into your kingdom, have mercy. This thief on the cross, let's quickly go back over his great theology. First of all, he's a witness. He's rebuking the first thief. He says, do you not even fear God? And, and by the way, that's on a side note, we need to learn to preach the fear of God. We're always preaching the love of God, but we need you to preach the fear of God to some people. We need to preach that that is why you need God, because you don't fear him properly and you're under condemnation. Second thing, he mentions condemnation. He doesn't mention that we've made mistakes and we're just dysfunctional. He uses the word condemnation Thirdly, he understands he himself does not deserve heaven. He understands his own wickedness. We are sinners, and justly and rightly we're being condemned. There's no self-adulation. He doesn't view himself as not that bad. So this is tremendous theology. He understands that the Savior is perfect. He's done nothing wrong. Such a broad statement. See, sometimes people prophesy, and they don't even know they're prophesying. You could read that in John. Uh, uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 11, when Caiaphas, it says, being high priest, said, yeah, he prophesied. He didn't even know he was prophesying, but he prophesied. That's right. This thief, he's done nothing wrong. Jesus is in a totally different category than every other religious leader. He has a sinless life, a sinless life. Everybody else who has walked the planet has sinned in some frame, form, or fashion. And then what we go on to see, rest of this here. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me. Let me tell you, even as, even as saints sometimes, we know the world, but I'm talking to saints. We're too busy going to our sister, our doctor, our banker, and our lawyer. Go to Jesus. Go to Jesus with some things. Go to Jesus. M maybe Jesus might tell you to go to someone else, but even saints sometimes, you can hear it in their voice. Oh, we better pray. Well, wh what you mean you better pray? What were you doing before you prayed? What were you doing before you talked to Jesus? Had you exhausted all of your earthly carnal options? For what we wrestle not against flesh and blood, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 10. So it goes on, assuredly I say to you, and this is what, when you tell Jesus, let me, let me just elaborate for a moment. Sometimes we have a prayer list, and this prayer list is kind of specific. This prayer list is kind of itemized. This prayer list is kind of detailed. Sometimes we just need to say, Lord, remember me. Because many times Jesus has more in store for us than we could have ever imagined. Prove it. Pastor John, prove it. Did this man think he was going to hear that he was going to be in paradise? Did he think he was going to hear he's going to be in paradise? Now, let me show you the deity of God, of Jesus Christ. I did say God. Oh, yes, God is going to show deity right here. He's going to show he's God, not because he's going to come down from the cross, not because he's going to raise the dead, but look at what he says to this thief. He says, and Jesus said to him, verse 43, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Wait a minute. Did you catch that? Did you catch that? I don't know if you caught it. So let me say it again. Today you will be with me in paradise. Oh, I, I want to preach this point just a little. 
How could Jesus say, today you'll be with me in paradise? He says it because, guess what? Jesus knows when the thief is going to die, and he knows when he's going to die. Glory to God. Amen. You see what I mean? Perfect knowledge. He knows every, he even knows when you're going to die. He knows when every ant, giraffe, when every dolphin, every whale is going to die. So what does Jesus say? He says, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Today. Perfect knowledge. See, that's why when Jesus says assuredly, because he even knows when you're going to die. So he can work things out before you die. People don't even know about tomorrow, but they promise you things. So notice this knowledge. So Jesus says today, that lets you know, Jesus is like, oh brother, I got this under control. You know how I got this under control? Today I got your back. Today I'm going to take care of this. Today. Why do I say today? Because nothing can stop me because I'm the son of God, because I'm God in the flesh. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. John chapter 1, beginning there at 1, verses 1 and 2, verse 14. So you'll see that. So Jesus says today. That reveals his deity. That reveals his omniscient. He knows when he's going to die. He knows when the thief is going to die. And he is able to bring all this to pass. That Jesus can bring people into the kingdom. And he could forbid people because there's no sign. By the way, let us not forget there are two thieves on this course. One is not going. One is not going to the kingdom. One is not going. One is too busy trying to challenge God on his authority. If you're the son of God, let me say to the, the, anybody who's listening to this, don't challenge God. Pray to God. Don't challenge God. Humble yourselves before this great God. Don't stand there questioning God in an arrogant way. Now, if you question God in that humble way as a child who desires knowledge, amen. Lord, why is this happening? Teach me your ways. Lord, why is this happening? Teach me your path. Lord, I'm ignorant. And if, if you're not going to tell me, grant me the grace to walk in faith, that's a whole different mindset than if you're the son of God, if you're God, if God is so loving, they say, do you hear people say that with such arrogance? Well, if God is so loving, he would not have allowed, really? What we have to remind ourselves is, and, and let me say this, the thief understands this. The second thief understands this, and we need to understand this. You know what we need to question God about? Come on now. We need to question God about why he's so good to us. Now, I don't know. I, I can't speak for everybody. But I've had some surgery, some different situations. My mother and father have both passed on. My, my uncles and aunts have all passed on. But I want to tell you this. I question why God is so good to me. I question why God is so compassionate to me. I question why God is so loving to me. As a matter of fact, like the second thief, when I'm in my right mind, I understand why all bad things happen to me. Because I deserve more bad than I've ever gotten in my life. I deserve hell. I deserve Hades. I deserve to, to, to be with the devil. But God in his grace has changed me. God in his grace has saved me. Not that I don't think I deserve that on any given day, but he's just been a good God. And I'll let you figure that out because we're always trying to make people feel good about themselves. But Jesus doesn't tell that thief, you're not so bad. Jesus doesn't tell that thief, hey, you're really not that bad. Jesus doesn't say a word about that. But when that man says, Lord, remember me, Jesus says, today you're going to be with me in paradise. What we need to remind all, if we're going to evangelize, that they need to understand how unworthy they are. Sometimes we just use the word sin, but this man gave a description of the condemnation. We indeed justly are under the same, we receive the due rewards. See, when, when things happen to a a, a right-minded person, we don't question God, why is this happening to me? I, I go to church. God, I, I pray a lot. I read my Bible. This shouldn't happen to me. We just say, God, you've been so good. You, you've been so good. You've been more, more, you've been more better. You've been more gooder. You've been more gooder. Amen. Improper English, but you need improper English to express the glory and the majesty and the greatness and the love of God. You need improper English because no language. I, I, on a side note, I think that's why we have the gift of tongues because there's no earthly language that could properly express. 
Amen. I know some of you want to get into that, that tongue issue, but we're not going to digress to that now. So look at what it goes on to say here. It says, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Did you know that when there's darkness on the earth, there's hope for a future paradise? Did you know when there's darkness all over the planet, there's hope for a future paradise? And, and the word paradise may not exactly mean heaven, but, but it's the sentiment we want to focus on, the place of being with Jesus. And notice, why is it paradise? See, people would focus on paradise, but not today you'll be with me. Better to be on a cross next to Jesus. You with me? Better to be on a cross next to Jesus. Now, we're gonna, people are going to say amen. But we'll know when trials come into our life if we believe it. I know I'm challenged with it. That's why I got to say, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. But it's better to be on a cross next to Jesus than in a palace next to a king. Oh, yes. Some of us, we, we want to sit in a plush seat in a car. The question is who we're sitting with. Amen. See, see when you're with Jesus on the cross, you're going to be with him in paradise. Nobody carries a cross for Jesus. And doesn't get to taste of the fruit of heaven and paradise and majestic glory. And please notice, I, I, I got to get ready to, to shut it down a little bit, but I want you to see what it goes on to say. Because paradise is the last thing. Today you'll be with me. Isn't that why it's paradise? Don't we have a great life if you know Jesus? Today you'll be with me. Today you'll be with me. I, I could just stop it right there. Let me tell you, if you don't know Jesus, today you could be with him. I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. I'm not going to tell you to accept Jesus as your personal savior. I'm going to tell you to go to God and pray. Pray and say, Lord, remember me. Ask the Lord to convict you of your sin. Show me my wickedness. Then show me my redemption. That's a, that's a Bible prayer. I'll let, you, I'll let the Holy Ghost lead you on how to word your prayer. I'm going to let the Holy Ghost lead you on how to repent. John the Baptist gave different steps of repentance. He says, if you're, if you got two tunics, go give away one. He says, don't, don't take more. If you got, if you, if you, if, if you take, don't take more than your wages. That was John the Baptist talking when they came asking, him, what must we do? He said, bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. So I'm careful of giving you a specific formula of how to enter the kingdom. I have no packaged delivery. Because Jesus doesn't have a package delivery. Because you know who Jesus has confidence in? The Holy Ghost. Oh yeah, the Holy Spirit is not just uh, the spirit that, uh, of the gift of tongues and, and the gifts of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit, unless a man is born of the Spirit, he was born of spirit is spirit, he was born of flesh is flesh. So look at that last, today you will be with me. See, even before paradise, I think we, we need to remember just being with Jesus is, is, is the blessing. Being with the Savior is the, is the greatness. It's the, it's, the, it's the all in all. It's, the, it's, it's what you call the, the jackpot, so to say. Just being with him. Yes, being with Jesus in the wilderness. What did Moses say, Lord, if your presence doesn't go with us? You could read that in Exodus. If your presence doesn't go with us, don't take us down to this land. We, he doesn't want to go to a promised land without the one who gave the promise. Let me say it again. Moses doesn't want to go to a promised land without the one who gave the promise. I fear sometimes we don't mind getting some material blessings, even if it has to push Jesus a little bit to the side. Have mercy. Have mercy. So again, and Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. I'd like to close on this. There's darkness on planet Earth. Not because of, a, of an illness that's going on in, in this current day of April of 2020. But there's just darkness. There's always going to be death. There's famine. There's crime, there's murder, there's illnesses of, of numeric sort, of, of a multitude. There's leukemia, cancer, we, we, you know, just so many illnesses. There's a darkness in this world. We need to tell Jesus, remember me? And, and, and even when we don't sense the world of the darkness, we could have these personal, oh yes, condemnation. We could have situations in our life that are like a cross, that are breaking us down, and even situations where we have not committed a particular wickedness, 
Amen. There are some things where it's just the trial of life. It's just the, the sorrow of, of this earthly existence. Somebody's hit by a car would never say that's an immediate judgment from God. Somebody's hit by a car, a stray bullet. Somebody gets an illness. Lord, remember me. And, 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 and let's, let's start thinking about the kingdom. Amen. See, this thief understood that, that he says, he, he obviously has a sense of the power of this other man hanging on a cross. He obviously understands that this man has some power. Jesus is on a cross, but he sees him as powerful. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. How did this thief know that this cross was not the end of Jesus? How did this thief know that this cross was not the end of, of, of this life? That he speaks with such future certainty that Jesus is going to somehow get off of this cross, come into a kingdom that is out of this world, because it's out of this world, and he's going to be able to bring him into it, or at least be remem remember him. Have mercy. I pray that this message would lead you to call upon Jesus, to ask him to remember you, and ask him to prepare you for the kingdom. I'm going to leave it at that. I believe there's enough said here, but I know the Holy Ghost could do it better than me. I'm giving a message, but I have no formula for you. But go to God, pray, Lord, remember me, and ask, and, and for us believers, let's ask the Lord, for the world, you need to repent to get to know Jesus, but let us get to know Jesus well. Let us remember that this darkness is not surpassed, this darkness does not surpass the glory of God. This darkness does not surpass the majesty of Jesus, the darkness of the world, and Jesus on the cross does not limit his power. May God be glorified in this message. May you be encouraged in soul. May you be blessed in heart and spirit. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.